not click that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, I think we're live now, finally. Thank you uh, for bearing with me here. Uh, this is my first time uh, launching it. Usually, uh, you know, we have others kind of covering it. But tonight, uh, we've got an awesome talk lined up. Uh, first, let me uh, do the typical rundown through Merge PHP and this awesome group of different user groups across the country here and hopefully the world one day. Uh, uh, basically, it consists of Atlanta PHP. Uh, you can find them on meetup.com. Most of these ones you can find up on meetup.com. Uh, Boston PHP, Austin, uh, definitely check out Longhorn PHP coming up. I believe that was uh, quietly uh, announced. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, uh, Seattle PHP. Uh, Tim Tim is feeling sick today, so shout out Tim. <laughs> and uh, Vancouver, my user group here in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, and uh c pug <laughs> kc pug i gotta and i've got to make it out there sometime utah yep believe uh marky run one of these as well right uh yeah this one yeah i figured that yeah so we're gonna have uh uh mark give a talk here about php applications at scale uh, basically going through and showing you tips and tricks on how to optimize things for your application and get things to scale. So I'm super excited about uh, tonight's uh, topic. Um, San Diego PHP uh, and um, P uh, what is this, Phoenix? Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so by the way, if you're in the... Um, if you're in the need of a JetBrains license, we give away a one-year JetBrains license. Thank you to our sponsors, JetBrains. They make awesome IDEs. Uh, just email Chris at atlantaphp.org. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get you hooked up. Uh, and maybe you can throw a comment in, in the YouTube chat. I might have an extra to throw out to somebody else if somebody wants to comment there. PHP support. Uh, I don't think we updated this yet. Uh, no, well, no, that looks about right. Yeah, about a week ago. So uh, going on Analyte here on 8.1. It should be on 8.2, 8.3. Uh, some awesome conferences lined up here soon. Just check out php.net conferences. I uh, just threw Cakefest on there, actually. I saw that Lu Luxembourg social uh definitely connect with us on twitter and all that good stuff uh and we also have um i believe in the official or well quasi official php uh slack for php ug uh you can find a public channel in there to if you want to connect with us uh and in may we've got ben's coding coming up uh so check that out uh and if you have a talk idea feel free to submit it to uh, mphp.io slash speakers. Uh, there's a form there. If you even are, you know, just learning PHP and you have stuff to share, we love to hear all, uh, you know, levels of talks. So, uh, yeah. And without further ado, let me bring Mark on the stage here. Hello, everybody. Hey, Mark. Right. So we're going to be talking about PHP applications at scale. You can read a little tidbit there. Um, I'll get my presentation going and go from there. Um, that. And you can see that okay. Oops, that is the wrong one. One second. Shuffle screens. There we go. Um, we're we'll talking about uh, PHP applications at scale. This is Merge PHP. Uh, you can find me at Longhorn, or sorry, not Longhorn, 
PHP Tech in two weeks. Um, talk with me. I'm always open to you know, meet new people and catch up with old acquaintances and friends and colleagues. Um, I'll be giving this talk there. So if you watch it here, don't bother coming at PHP Tech for that talk. Find someone else that track. Uh, but I do also have uh, two others. There's a PHP coding competition with some cool prizes um, and another one about the repository pattern. I want to start off with my favorite pastime, which is snowmobiling. Um, this is me in the mountains just a couple weeks ago, uh, about 9,400 feet elevation uh, near a family cabin um, on five or six feet of snow. Um, I'm riding an old 2002 Ski Doo 800, um, which, when it's tuned right and is maintained correctly, runs amazing. It's fast, it's got a lot of power. Um, it's not like the new ones where it can carve and turn as easily, but it'll get you around and enough to be plenty fun. Um, but like every snow, every snowboat has a story, uh, especially a maintenance story. Um, this one had a loose spark plug and resulted in uh, the engine overheating a bit and the oil tank leaking. <laughs> I had to replace. Uh, I had an exhaust manifold that was uh, cankered on with rust uh, that was not fun to get off. And uh, it's the, the hood is starting to come apart a little bit. And it had, to, anyways, every year there's maintenance to be done. Every year there's something that needs fixed or maintained on uh, snowmobiles. And if you maintain them and take the time to figure out what's wrong, you can make them run fast. You can make them you know, just as enjoyable as they, as, as a new one, or as, as the day they were new. Um, it just takes a little bit more maintenance, a little bit more time digging in and figuring out what's going on, what's causing the problem and fixing it. When you have it well-maintained, it'll run great, it's fun. Uh, if you don't take care of it, you run into problems and it can really come back to bite you. Um, that's just like uh, the analogy here for um, scaling PHP applications. As, we, as you take care of it, as you really dig in to see what's going on and put in the time and effort to make it fast, it's going to be much more enjoyable for you and for your customers and everyone else that gets to use it. Just like a good snowmobile. Um, Taking that time will make a big difference. So there was a study done in 2022 asking how many ants are in the world. <laughs> I got thinking, you know, how many are in my backyard alone? You know, I'm sure tens of thousands. And now we're looking at the worldwide, and it is a ginormous number, 20 quadrillion. Um, 20 followed by a lot of zeros, or two and a half million ants per person, which is an uh, astronomical amount of ants. And thinking about that, if you were to write an application, a PHP application, that tracked every single ant in the world, could you do it? Um, there's three typical steps you take. You make it work, you make it right, you make it fast. As very common progression of applications that we see, very common pattern to follow um, in, in just in general throughout uh, develop, the development world. Um, making it work, you know, it might be slow, but at least it does something. Make it right. You're trying to put in good architecture, follow good, better patterns, um, and then making it fast you know, to make it actually usable and enjoyable to use. So we're thinking about that kind of scale here as we talk through this. Um, maybe not 20 quadrillion, but definitely in the billions range um, or millions or, you know, maybe smaller depending on your use case that you're running it up against. Um, the objective here is to have a better understanding of how to make applications faster um, at size or at scale um, and make those applications so they can scale, so they can, you know, handle those larger sizes, larger volumes. Um, and when I think larger, I'm thinking data sets that they have to support is the typical um, speed problem. Um, it might be a large code base, um, but more troublesome tends to be either this is the data size or the uh, request size, the amount of requests coming in, the amount of 
data has to be crunched or processed through the application. And really trying to work towards application stabilization, which is when you get to work on new features rather than fix issues. Uh, we'll go into the need for speed, why it's important, some SQL optimizations and tips and tricks, some infrastructure considerations. Uh, that is not my forte, but there's some pointers there. And a good chunk of it will be spent on PHP optimizations and a little game of will it scale. <laughs> so I'll be thinking about maybe some of your uh, favorite PHP functions. So the need for speed. Um, first and foremost, uh, at least in the commercial world, is making your customers happy. Uh, and customers like and appreciate the responsive applications that respond quickly when you have a request come in. Uh, these are often customers that are paying. Um, and it, when you have that scalability, that speed, it's going to make customers happier. They're more likely to stay with you as a customer. Um, you can then retain them as customers, and it's easier to sell. You have you know, that increased volume to be able to handle the onboarding and, and customer support. So from a financial standpoint, it's really important to have um, that scalability. As you make your applications faster, you know, if you take a process that's taking five or six hours and reduce it down to five or six minutes, uh, that's a say, cost savings. That's an actual cost savings, you know, especially if you're hosting it in a place where you're paying for processing, uh, paying for server size, paying for memory, paying for disk space, all those kind of things. Um, that is a big difference on the cost, um, being able to have smaller servers um, and fewer resources to be able to handle the same amount of data as a big deal and can save you a lot of money as an organization. And hopefully you can focus, like I mentioned earlier, focus on getting more things done, actual things that you'd like to work on. You know, you can work on upgrades and enhancements and new features. Um, and developing these things that are going to make a bigger long-term impact um, rather than always fixing and patching and repairing things as you go along. Um, there's a big, there's a chart, historical, it's where you know the cost of finding a bug early on is way less. And the same goes for performance. The sooner you can find it, the earlier you find it, it's going to be easier to fix. Um, and you're not having to scramble and fix it at the last minute and having to patch or hotfix or change or go through uh, different hurdles to get things fixed up. Um, if you can prevent the problem, that's ideal. Um, it can reduce the incidents that are going on, reduce the amount of you know, outages or denial of service, your self the self dosing or whatever. Um, SQL optimizations. Uh, to me, I consider uh, being able to optimize database queries as an essential skill set and essential component of optimizing, speeding up applications, being able to know what scales and what doesn't, and different strategies for uh, resolving those problems. Uh, first and foremost is choosing your database management system wisely. You know, it might be Postgres, it might be MySQL, it might be SQL Server, it might be Oracle, it might be Single Store, it might be a whole slew of other databases out there, a Mongo or whatever. Uh, but just choose wisely. Look at the performance benefits, uh, you know, what what they do best, what they, and which one meets your needs. Um, there is no magic answer. Where you should always use the specific one. Um, but it's choosing one that's best for your your ap application, what your needs are. And so, just doing a little bit of research ahead of time, if that's an option, that's a luxury most projects, existing projects don't have. But if you do have that luxury. Definitely make sure you take some time and figure out what's going to work best for you, um, because each one does have a different um, um, different pros and cons as you go through them, as you work with them, different scalability, um, and making sure that you keep it maintained, upgraded. Um, most database plat platforms, engines will release updates, and so just making sure you're continually upgrading them. They will put in performance improvements and security patches and new features. And just keeping up current on that is really helpful. Uh, you know, it's an easy win typically for uh, optimizing your application um, and speeding things up. 
kind of a basic one here, but uh, selecting only the columns that you need. Um, so going back to the ant example, if you select star from ant, that's going to return 20 quadrillion rows with all sorts of columns that might be in there. When if all you really need is the ID and the name for that ant, then just select those two columns. Um, that's going to be significantly less data, uh, which is going to be you know, data going from the database server across the network to the, the web server and being processed and put into memory and ready to disk and all sorts of things. So much more efficient to just select what you need, especially avoid selecting large columns, you know, like a long text or um, other larger fields. Uh, avoid selecting them unless you actually need them. Uh, group buys are expensive typically. So anytime you have like a select distinct, you know, whatever, and then group by, uh, that is going to be really expensive um, because of the aggregation that has to happen on the database server. Um, so anytime I see a group by, I'm usually cringing and thinking about, okay, how can we restructure this query to avoid that group by? And what can we do differently? Um, so maybe instead we're wanting to get just the ant type. In this case, you know, this is looking at 20 quadrillion rows, trying to just get the ants that are available. Or if instead we have an ant type table that defines those out, we can just select the ant type from the table and we're done in a fraction of a second rather than you know however long that other query would take. So just taking those consideration, those things into consideration. Um, sometimes it's necessary, um, but if you can avoid it, that's ideal. One of the biggest benefits um, is using indexes and using them correctly. They can be used and they can be abused really easily. <laughs> um, so in this case, we have select ant ID from ant as A, join ant colony as AC. Um, and as it gets down here and there's a conditional of like percent A uh, on ant name, um, that's going to be a really expensive query. Um, without the right index, it's also not going to be useful um, because it's, it's a far card and it's a pre a preface wild card. Um, you know, looking at how you can structure those queries to be differently, you know, maybe you only allow uh, wildcards that follow rather than before. It can really help with indexing and being able to use the indexes to perform better. Um, we'll get more into like adding indexes, but really most of the queries I run into, uh, a proper index can really help. Um, it's one of the things that's high on my list, my checklist of what, what can help and what won't. Uh, every database engine I've worked on has had some sort of show explain extended um, where it'll just, then you put the query in, uh, making sure you do the extended version and it'll tell you what the database engine is thinking and what it's going to be doing and how it's basically it's the query planner and looking to see what indexes it's going to be using or if it's going to be using indexes for the lookups. Uh, if it's not, Look and see if you can change the query to match up with existing indexes or consider adding a new index to cover it. Um, it's a really useful tool for figuring out what's good and bad with queries. Uh, limiting information. Um, you know, in this case, instead of selecting quadrillion, uh, 20 quadrillion rows, we're just limiting it down to maybe 100. Because most of the time, users aren't going to be looking at you know, millions of rows at the same time. They wanted to see a small, a small data set. And so limiting the data makes it, you know, it's a quick, easy win, um, especially on any table that's of any large size. Um, and also useful for chunking, moving through data. So, you know, if you had to move through 100 chunk data sets at a time, 100 rows at a time, that's gonna be using a lot less memory than, you know, if you're using, going through you know, a billion rows at a time. That's going to be really memory intensive, data intensive. We're going to have our PHP building up all these huge objects and uh, talking up the resources. Or if we're just moving through small data sets like this, it's going to be a lot less memory intensive. Um, it might have a little bit more overhead on the processing side, um, but it will scale better than doing larger chunks. And so finding that right chunk size too is important. You know, maybe some applications it's 5,000, maybe it's 50,000, maybe it's 5 million. Uh, it varies. I usually find it's usually in the tens of thousands range, but it might be different. 
Um, inner select cache or common table expression. Uh, so select, well, whatever, join, and putting the parentheses and having it as, at least in this case, maybe ant colony stats. Um, we'll cache that inner query and then join on the that. So that's a little trick for avoiding big tables, you know, lookups over and over again. Uh, you can use the join as syntax. Um, indexes, um, kind of getting into some of like the, the pros and cons form a bit more, uh, circling back to those. Um, they do allow for faster reads, uh, but you do have to consider the insert, update, and delete cost for them. Um, it, the, it goes and makes the data readily available. It's going to be a faster lookup, but it's also stored in, in, on, on disk or memory, depending on your index. And so just take that in consideration. Uh, you can have multiple indexes on multiple columns, um, but make sure you're forming what's going to be needed. Um, the concept of denormalization for optimization uh, is real. <laughs> uh, normalization as the high level is a database design principle uh, dealing with data integrity and a way to eliminate uh, having duplicate data. Because um, then you want to have the database the same consistency. And so uh, there's various form levels uh, from first normal form up to, I think there's 11 different normalization levels now. Um, I usually find somewhere around third or voice cod or fourth are ideal, um, but not beyond that for practical real world scenarios. Um, but as you normalize data, you're going to have more tables with data spread across those. You know, kind of an extreme level would be example would be if you have um, users' first names, you would have a table for first names only. And the user table would have like user first name ID would point to the user, to the first name table, you know, to reduce those duplicates. Um, it's not really practical. Uh, you just can just put the first name in the user table, um, which is denormalization for optimization as an example there. Composite foreign keys uh, help address the problem of denormalization with data integrity. Uh, so let's say you have the ant table and you're joining ant type and ant species to it. Uh, it can be a pretty expensive join depending on how it's worked out and data sizes. Uh, if you foreign key ant type and um, ant, you know, the ant type ID and ant type, uh, you can reference those, the ant type and ant type ID um, and have an update on Cascade. So it is expensive if the ant type changes, it'll go and update all the records in the ant table. Um, but then you can just do a select star from, or select ant, in, ant type from the ant table um, rather than having to go do that join. So the demoralization reduces joins, um, but increases your data storage and the number of columns. Uh, but it is there is way there are ways with uh, relational databases to ensure data integrity still. So it's just a strategy that you can use um, to help speed up database queries. I so said there's pros and cons to it, but it is a, a viable strategy. Um, Already, they already talked about those cons. That in, increased table size and longer time for maintenance. Same time, you have a larger database, it's just be more expensive and timely to maintain. It's the biggest downside. I think I didn't talk about that. I thought I had a slide in here, but uh, is temp tables. Um, some database engines can benefit from using temp tables to push data in temporarily, um, which are stored on disk or memory, depending on how you configure them, um, and pushing common data into the temp table, and then you can join off those temp tables. It's just a way to reduce the, you know, if you're joining two large tables, it's having to go through both tables. If you can push a subset of the large table into a temp table, and then you can use that temp table as the base to join off to his other large table, that often will help reduce memory as well, or increase performance on it. Um, it's a common strategy I've seen and used in the past. Moving on to infrastructure optimizations. Um, I support and suggest and recommend using a queuing system. Um, you have, there's 
lots of different commercial and open source projects available um, from Rabbit to SQS and others. And uh, just admit, but this, mainly the strategies um, break your jobs apart into small jobs rather than having one job do a whole bunch of different things, just have them do little things, dare I say microservice style, but um, uh, just breaking them apart um, so that they're not doing too much. Um, just like when you want code to be reusable, uh, you want your jobs to be reusable uh, doing small things. That'll maximize your output, your throughput. Um, a database uh, theory tells you that uh, the fastest way to get queries through a database engine is small queries first. Um, and same goes for queuing things. The smaller the job, the more throughput you're going to have. Less like you're going to have jobs taking hours to finish. Um, it just helps spread the work out and improves your user experience. If, you know, if users are having to wait two seconds versus two, 10 or two hours, it's a lot better for the two seconds. You just break it apart whenever you can. Um, cache when reasonable. Uh, caching can really help speed things up and take a burden off the back end code. Uh, you, can, you can cache request responses. So if you see the same request come in, you can just respond with that same response. We've already figured it out. Uh, caching session information were needed. Uh, so you're not having to hit the database table so much, uh, but use wisely is the recommendation there. Uh, caching JavaScript, your images and other resources. Um, typically have gone with a solution where your JavaScript is built into a single minified file and then using cache busting by the versioning. Um, so in the URL, it's just a little bit different, but it still points to that cached file or that file. And so you're, you're busting the cache. So if you deploy a new version, then the users always get it without having to clear their cache. So an important consideration. Now the, my favorite part of PHP optimizations. Um, first and foremost, we covered PHP supported versions. And so first is to upgrade your PHP version um, every I follow internals pretty closely. I'm kind of a silent listener. Uh, there's always optimizations uh, being put in. And so easy, uh, not, maybe not easy, but a relatively easy win is to upgrade your PHP version. That'll help with reducing your memory use and speeding up your processing overall. Uh, PHP 8.4 is actively being discussed and worked on, and, uh, but 8.3 is the current, of course. Uh, my experience has told me that if you're doing something that's not really, doesn't really make sense why you're doing it, but it makes it faster, then document it, just add that comment in the code, add that doc block, and just explain why you're doing it um, so that the person coming up behind you will know why you did it instead of scratching their head wondering why. Um, I, I'm going to be using uh, phpbench.com. We'll go through some of their, the findings on there. Uh, it's put out by Chris Vincent. Vincent, um, it's using PHP 8.2. I also did a whole bunch of my own benchmarking though, and we'll get through uh, both of those. Um, going into the various PHP little snippets of code, what works and what doesn't. So uh, this first one um, is for each versus four. Uh, so some interesting findings here, and he puts his conclusion on here. Um, and basically stating that the uh, the for each, um, see, the, the for each loop is substantially faster than the for loop, uh, which was a little surprising to me. Um, but you can, uh, just a consideration is the for each versus for. Um, and he's, he's using 100 elements, 24 kilobyte or byte keys, and 10K data per entry, so pretty long. Uh, this was the times on there. Uh, it makes sense that. Building up an array is going to take up more time. That's the orange one, the 354%. Um, but just a consideration. Um, you don't have to have the um, the data. That you have. Be smart about it, what you're doing there. Um, I was surprised that for each um, x as y, or the first one there, was slower than using the as key value, uh, even though you don't, you didn't use the key. It was an interesting one. Uh, modified loop, so for each versus four, uh, where you're doing something inside the for each or the for loop. 
Um, the for each was terribly slow compared to the for loop. Um, so that's very significant. So that's a major consideration um, that the for each, um, for whatever reason, is much faster. Um, counting loops um, is a for loop uh, test. They are all relatively close, um, count versus size of. Um, not like huge differences there, so nothing too surprising. Um, the for loop versus while loop. Um, for loop was a little bit slower than the while. I tend to use for loops more than while loops, but you know, it's not like a huge benefit, but there is some, there's some uh, benefit there to using the while instead. The single quotes versus double quotes. Um, always the, the historically was really bad, um, but more current versions of PHP handle doubles quotes versus single quotes much better. Um, historically, double quotes has been slower because it's you know, going through and processing most data in there, but um, it is now much closer than it used to be uh, from a processing perspective. Um, to the point where they're nearly identical on timing and, and whatever else. Um, basically, the, the finding is that they're equivalent. Um, we're very close to each other. I did my own benchmarking on this too. We'll get into that, but it's very similar findings. Is set versus empty. Um, these were not surprising. We're very close on, on all of them. They're all within you know, region of margin, or yeah, the margin of error of being identical. Um, the uh, switch case, their switch and if statements, um, he doesn't have match, and I did match. So we'll get into what my findings were for match versus switch. Um, start thinking about your predictions there. But um, so switch case uh, versus it was slower than the if else, especially when if else was using uh, strict types. Not really surprised with that one at all. Uh, the loose case if else was basically the same speed as the switch case. Um, I was surprised though that default with the switch case was slower. Um, the same with an else statement. I guess it has to go run that code. Um, outputting, uh, so we have echo versus a print. Um, Basically the exact same amount of time, uh, depending on, let's see, there's a whole bunch of benchmarks there, but um, they go on print functions, so the exact same purpose. Uh, let's see, just a comma versus um, periods, the outputs. All right, so that was his benchmarks. Uh, from Again, his was around PHP 8.2. Uh, mine are on, uh, PHP 8.3, I used 100,000 iterations. I was using a million, but some of them were too slow. <laughs> and so uh, I just went with 100,000, uh, just to be able to run it. Um, built up an array basically uh, outside of these loops, uh, which was an array of tests um, with a random number uh, behind it. Uh, Something like a large number, but um, it has, you know, Few characters in there. Uh, first one, arrays. So, explain what's going on here. The function, uh, I, I made functions for each of these individual ones, as many function names, descriptive of what's going on. The time is in milliseconds. Um, let's see, time's in milliseconds. The memory is in kilobytes. Uh, is like, basically, I did a before starting and then after starting. Um, and then the code is uh, loosely basically what it's doing uh, in the back end. Um, some of them have no memory, which is because it wasn't doing anything with the values. Um, but things that we're building up, you'll see like some memory usage there. Um, so array key is set. Uh, it was you know, pretty quick. Um, there's the next one is a create, just a creating array. Uh, we'll get into the object one, so that's an important one to note. Uh, array versus object. 
um, array four uh, was very fast. Uh, modifying values was, of course, slower. Um, the uh, modify down there, uh, the four modify was about a little bit slower than that one. Uh, for each as value versus for each key as value. Um, the for each as value was faster on 8.3. Um, the one we looked at 8.2 was had the for each as value is uh, slower, uh, which is an interesting find. Um, but I, I generally found that the, uh, let's say the for each X is Y was faster, which is what I would have expected to be anyways. Um, for each key is value modify. Uh, is just going in there and changing the value, adding on a dash test on it. That one was, of course, a little bit slower. Um, Ray implode was extremely slow. Um, we should avoid using it, <laughs> dare I say, avoid using it. Um, build your data smarter if you can. Uh, just know that, especially in we're trying to do it 100,000 times, it is really expensive. Um, it is exponential because we have 100,000 and 100,000. Um, but uh, either way you look at it, it was slow compared to the other things that were going on. Um, the array in array was also very slow. The loose check was surprisingly faster than the strict te check. So in array test, you know, the faults versus true there, uh, defaults to faults. Uh, surprised though that the strict was slower. Um, I don't know why, but it is. If you know why, maybe put it in the, the chat or something. Um, Ray key exists. Um, was pretty fast versus is set. Uh, the is set is what's faster, was my what I found. Um, when you're checking the Ray key exists versus is set, so my takeaway is use is set instead of Ray key exists. Um, with the caveat, you know, make sure that it's actually set though. So I'm checking a little bit different things. Um, Array keys, not surprisingly, is pretty slow. It goes and grabs all the array keys and builds up those in array. Um, but array values was really fast. Oh, I don't know. Control, control structures. So this is like if else is in the match. Here is where the match was faster than the switch, uh, which is not surprising since match is essentially a strict type switch check. Um, and just like the other findings on A2, uh, on PHP A3, the if else strict typing was definitely faster. Um, that the loose was 6.38 and the fast was 3.72. Um, ran multiple times and they generally were always like the same ballpark uh, numbers. So it's not like they were like significantly different. Um, I said, use the match whenever you can and use the strict typing on if else. Um, which is kind of the prominent theme is strict typing is better than loose almost all the time that I could find. Hashing, I should have found more of these. This is something I think we need, I need to expand on still, but um, I, I ran it though for MD5 and SHA-1. Uh, MD5 was a little bit faster than SHA-1, but not significantly. Objects, so the create object took four milliseconds to run to 100,000, um, and setting a value was 14.74. So if I jump back up to keep in mind to the ray one, oops, the ray create was one, one millisecond versus four milliseconds, um, which I was surprised, um, just knowing that I've, I've been heard and told that PHP objects are faster than, or take less memory and are faster than arrays. Um, maybe my test was not quite ideal. It doesn't cover that, but my finding was arrays were faster. Um, so if you maybe if you can think of a, a different ch ch check or way to test that, put in the comments, but uh, or we'll bring it up at the end here. Uh, JSON decode and JSON encode were atrocious with performance. Um, the time in milliseconds there, it took a long time to run those. Uh, Takeaway is avoid them. It's a necessary evil though with uh, APIs. Uh, if we want JSON format, it's gonna be faster than building an XML typically. Um, but if you have some sort of way to speed up JSON encode and decode, uh, definitely do that. Um, I have dealt with uh, large data sets. I found streaming 
uh, especially JSON uh, decoding, where you're taking the data and building up uh, the string and building up data. If you can stream it, that is significantly faster than trying to JSON decode the entire large data set. Um, so that's a consideration um, and with encoding and decoding is if you can find a way to stream it instead, if you're doing work that's very intensive here, uh, that may be a benefit for you. Strings. Uh, add slashes was uh, a little bit on the slow side. Uh, double quotes uh, versus the single quotes was essentially the same amount of time. Um, the double quotes empty versus single quotes empty uh, was the double quotes was a little bit faster, weirdly, uh, than single quotes. Um, pretty close though. Echo versus print. Uh, generally, print was slightly faster, but not like significantly faster. So uh, I usually use print or echo, but I rarely use echoes anyways. I usually let the framework take care of that. Um, and also printr versus var dump. I thought, oh, I might as well throw those two in the classic developer debugs. And the, you don't have X debug available for you for some reason. Um, printr was much faster than a var dump. And the var dump gives you more data, though. Uh, so uh, either way, though, avoid. Make sure you don't leave them in. <laughs> or just use a tool like xdebug, and you don't have to worry about them. Made some charts, because charts are pretty. Um, we have implode, uh, which is the, the one on the right, or sorry, the far left. Uh, you see the JSON decode and JSON encode on the far right. Uh, these were the ones that were slow. In array, ray keys were also pretty slow there. Um, so slow that I had to put them on separate charts. These are in seconds rather than milliseconds um, because otherwise the other charts were unreadable. Um, now this is significantly more readable, but <laughs> um, the crypto or the hashing, I should say, the MD5 and shell one were slow. The bar dump or the, the slowest three, um, rendering this out. Um, but you can see the, the rest of them kind of smashed together uh, where they are on. Again, this is 100,000 calls each um, and where they compare uh, versus each other. So you see like the double quotes in there about the same in the far right. Um, you have is set versus empty versus you know setting the values. Um, anyways, we've kind of gone through all these numbers. This is kind of the visual, more visual side of it. Um, and that's the timing. This one is the memory usage. Again, this I didn't do great testing here. Um, it depends on if you're building up the data weirdly, or maybe not weirdly, but maybe even predictably. The data memory kilobytes was very similar for uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, the echo and print had some memory because I had to do um, output buffering capturing, so it didn't put 100,000 lines all the time, uh, which explains why there's memory usage there. Um, so it was, probably would actually be zero, but they had to write the, the test, the benchmarks for it, uh, made it so I had some. Um, anyways, so just come in interesting findings um, on, on those. I've talked about this before already, but a highlight, if you're using implode, in array, array keys, JSON encode, JSON decode, um, may be worth looking into it, especially if you're having slowdowns in those areas. Um, but more so, they say these examples are pointing towards where I had, we're doing basically like double looping. And so anytime you're double looping, watch out um, because you start to get into exponentially slow processing. You know, if you're doing an array merge, for example, inside of a loop, it's usually bad. <laughs> uh, and so good is doing an array merge outside a loop, better, because there's a good, better, best concept. So good is doing it as a loop. Better is to build the array smarter, so you don't have to do the array merge later. Or best, use collections or data transfer objects or value objects or something else. So you don't have to do array merging anyways. Um, that's kind of the end of like the discussion part. Um, I do you want to take it? Uh, I'll get through, I'll finish through here, and then we get, we'll open it for questions. Um, after after the end, after it gets through all these, uh, the 
last few things here. Um, but just be thinking about maybe other things uh, to benchmark. Like, is there something else you, you'd like to see uh, benchmarked? You know, for comparison purposes. Um, maybe what have you seen that was that it tonight that was unexpected, or was maybe expected instead? And maybe what other tips or tricks have you found for optimizing your PHP applications? Um, we've gone over. Uh, kind of the need for speed, uh, SQL optimization, the infrastructure, PHP, kind of a will at scale questions. We saw the ones that worked and which ones didn't. Um, hopefully the takeaway here is that um, evaluate um, all levels of your application, whether it's database infrastructure, your PHP code, or maybe all other things. Uh, maybe you're reading in files, maybe you have API calls, external resources in particular. Um, consider what you're doing and what maybe you how you can fix those kind of problems you know maybe database you're thinking data retention you know if the database is so big you know maybe you can get rid of some data or the infrastructure side you're thinking um, you know we can start adding a queuing system we talked about you know php side you're thinking through some of those bottlenecks some of those slow points of pain points and thinking about how you can speed things up um, maybe it's streaming or whatever else um, Find ways to benchmark your applications. There's great tools um, within PHP for benchmarking, where you can go and see what's actually go, uh, going on with the profilers. Um, that will tell you what what's taking a long time and what's not, and you can go uh, address those issues. Um, and then watch out for those slow functions. So questions. I will um, go to end my screen share. And Thanks, Mark. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to post them in the YouTube comments. Um, I'm not seeing any. Uh, some some feedback from Bobby. Documenting your hacks may take you a bit longer, but it will save the company, project, etc., a much larger amount of time in the future maintenance. In future maintenance. I, yeah, I've definitely ran into that. <laughs> you kind of sit there scratching your head, wondering what, why is this doing this? This has got to be a bug. Uh, but then it turns out it's not. It was intentional. And so, yeah, I totally agree, Bobby, on that one. Um, I, I've got a question for you. So um, ha, do you have any examples or, or suggestions on, like, how to sell the concept of spending developer time optimizing versus building features. Because uh, sometimes selling it, right, like there's, there's so much in flight, you don't have time sometimes. Like recently, I just upgraded PHP, and then I'm like, I, did I even turn on JIT? So I go and do it, and my whole site, like, way faster. Little things like that, you know, buying time, like I just found side time, but it's like asking your boss uh to, i have some strategies i'm just curious if if you do as well yeah i've definitely found that selling technical debt or developer projects can be a hard sell to to companies to corporations um in the past i've tried to make it the 20 percent rule where 20 percent of my time was spent optimizing or upgrading the back end code um and that has been a good way to push back on usually the product team and project managers to say, you know, we really need to invest time in this because it's going to save us you know, going back to the, bring it back to the dollars. You know, the, the customers are going to be happier. We can keep our customers if it's running faster. We're going to be more likely to be happy with our product if we're doing this. And so that, that's the way I've spun it in the past. Uh, to, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a customer experience benefit. Uh, there's, it's yeah. not like super glamorous, you know, you can't see new features when you're doing it, but it's the speed up that, that makes a difference. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree, right? Like expressing that stuff to your boss. And then even if they do say no, um, I've taken outages or uh, issues and have brought up this as like a point again too, right? Like, mm -hmm. cause, cause not only with performance, but just taking time to clean up technical debt in general, right? Um, is, 
is a good strategy. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> always think, that battle between features and optimization, right? Yeah, I think doing a retrospective on, you know, when you have those big incidents come up, you know, where you get together and just talk about you know, what happened, why did it happen, how can we prevent it in the future? And it can be a good avenue as well for you know, communicating the need for investing in the, the application, this, this performance side of it. Um, I've, I've got a question about query caching because uh, I'm using Symfony and, uh, you know, I've got Doctrine and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious, like, depending on the framework you're working with, what are some of the first go-tos you look for as far as, like, optimizations? I mean, outside of just, I guess, like, running cache build or whatever in the CLI, um, is there configurations that you tend to look for? Yeah, that's that's always a tricky one because it, it depends on the framework you're using, each one, and you know, which version of the framework as well. Uh, I usually go looking at the recommendations online, you know, reading through the configuration, you know, the options, what's available, what's not. You know, it might be something simple like you know, the service manager. You know, is it, is it how does it work? You know, how's it loading these you know, the classes? It might be on the database side. It might be on the, the, you know, the models. It could be. All sorts of different levels is the guess is the problem. There's no like magic bullet I, I know of. But also, I think it's important to look into like the caching mechanisms, especially of you know, how does it, how does the platform interact? You know, what are, what is your caching solution? What, how are you using it? You know, are you leveraging it the right way or the wrong way? Um, yeah, I, I think it, var it varies so much. Um, I do typically like to also push that problem to uh, infrastructure when I can. Uh, so, you know, sometimes they've got some tools up their belt and up their sleeves that they can use. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, so, uh, yeah, cool. I guess, let, let's see, we don't have any other questions. Uh, if people want to uh, get a hold of the slides, uh, can you, like, post a link in the chat here or something for them? Yeah, I don't have it up right now, but I, I'll go post it. Uh, I have a GitHub repository where I put all my presentations. That was something I've been trying to do this year. So I'll put it up there here shortly. Um, you can search for Mark Niebuhr all probably in the next few days, early next week, um, and you can see it. OK, cool. Sounds good. Uh, and if people want to find you, uh, where where can they get a hold of you? Did you can you find me. Yeah, you can find me on Mastodon at MB Niebergall. Um, also on a whole bunch of Slack channels and Discord channels. If it's PHP related, I'm probably on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, cool. Um, I guess uh, typically at the end, we talk about any sort of like n news developments um, in BHP's world. Um, did, did you have anything to share, Mark, that you've kind of caught wind of over the last month? Um, I, so watching internals, there's been a lot of activity. It's been super active um, uh, of things coming up in H4 I'm pretty excited about. Um, there are property hooks that's being actively discussed. Uh, Larry Garfield and others have been heavily involved in that. That's something I'm pretty excited about watching carefully. Um, also, the release managers um, are being just decided for H4 currently. Eric Mann sounds like he's going to be the veteran. And, uh, the release manager, he's the current one for 8.3, so he'd be the one for 8.4 as well, um, along with a couple supporting casts. Um, I think we uh, need to bring a couple people up on the stage here, too, uh, some of the organizers. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, Ian brought himself. Anybody else, uh, I guess, turn your video on and I'll bring you in. Didn't even think about this. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I was unfortunately on a call that ran long earlier, so I didn't get to uh, catch it, uh, catch the beginning of uh, this merge PHP when it happened. But a uh, little bit of news on the conference front. Um, so this year, uh, as some of y'all may know, Laracon, uh, at least the US version, bounces around a bit uh, into uh, different cities depending on the year. And so last year was Nashville. This year is uh, Dallas. Given that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have 
uh, two PHP conferences in Texas, one in Chicago, and none anywhere else. Um, thought, okay, well, what would make a bit more sense than running Longhorn PHP 2024? And uh, there had been dis some discussions last year uh, between Elena and uh, kind of the Longhorn organizing team of like, okay, well, what can we do to get regional PHP conferences back off the ground in areas that are not just uh, Austin or Chicago. And uh, with that, uh, Elena has done a whole lot of uh, legwork. And uh, this year, uh, Longhorn will be seating our position on the uh, conference schedule to uh, Cascadia PHP. And with that, Elena, uh, I'll let you uh, fill everybody in on kind of what that means in terms of uh, bringing Cascadia PHP back. Uh, sure. Yeah, we're, we're really excited. We have uh, the dates and locations secured at the University Place Hotel, if anyone has been at Cascadia before. It's really a great place to get to. It's right on the max line, and so it's easy to navigate around in Portland, especially for those who want to come to the city and explore. So it's a good place to stay, um, and they just have a great uh, just really a great working with the people at that at the university place and great food and good coffee and all of that stuff. So we're really excited. So it's going to be this year on October 24th through the 26th. So we are just getting all of our uh, paperwork updated and website updated and sponsorship uh, prospectus updated and all of that stuff. So. Uh, you can email um, leadership or sponsors or Alina at Cascadia. You can find us. Um, you'll be able to find us on. You can you can go to Cascadia PHP right now, and you'll see old dates there. We'll have the new stuff up this week, and hopefully we will have uh, CFPs and all that getting ready to launch. And we'll have a lot more to share next month. Yeah. So uh, once again, that's. October 24th through the 26th. Thank you, Elena. And I've uh, already booked uh, my flight up there uh, to attend. I'm looking forward to it. Made it to both 2018 and uh, 2019 editions of the conference, as I recall. And uh, it, it's it's good to see uh, Cascadia back. And um, from both myself and the other folks on the uh, Longhorn PHP organizing team, uh, we'll be kind of throwing our weight behind uh, Cascadia this year and, you know, helping out as we can. Um, if you're on the Longhorn PHP list, you'll be getting an email uh, from us that says, well, basically what we just said uh, on video here, uh, that if you want to attend a Thursday, Friday, Saturday um, in-person PHP conference uh, by the community, for the community, and kind of a regional focus, Cascadia is the one to attend this year. Um, and of course, tech is there as well. That's coming up in a few weeks, but like, uh, hopefully I'll see a lot of y'all in Portland. Take, take my money, take my money. <laughs> take, take it number one bot. <laughs> Nice, Ian, nice. Ian just like yeah, swooped in and swooped out with that news. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, he's, yeah Ian, Ian's already booked to come. Like, <laughs> he hasn't even had tickets up, and he's already booked his flights. Yeah, he's, no, he's no, on Ian. It. Yeah, so. he's got the venue picked out. Like the technical <laughs> stuff's already checked. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so, what's the website? Uh, CascadiaPHP.com. Okay. Cool. That's awesome. And I share, I did share it in the YouTube uh, chat as well Sweet. for people there. I'll share it again. Um, like I said, it's the old information right now. Sure. But uh, it will be updated this week. We got in and got the those details moved around and we'll be updating it with all the new dates. But it's, like I said, the new dates will be there, but it's the same location. So you'll be able to see that as well. And hopefully you'll be able to join us. I'm excited to have people. I love Portland area. So we have um, 
it's a great place to come visit. So if you've all been looking for an excuse to come out west, I would highly recommend making that trip down. Uh, there's also a lot of easy transportation between Portland and Seattle. So if you've been looking to do either of those and want to make a whole trip of it, uh, either of those works. It's there's the train, there's a train and um, bus and all kinds of things that run between. So if either of them is better to fly into and you want to go check out, check one out, uh, fly into one, fly out of another, enjoy the Pacific Northwest. It should be a really good time. Nice. I I'm excited to see where the venue's at just because uh, Longhorn was great. Uh, but when you're at that hotel, you like need to Uber everywhere. Oh yeah. Well, so the like, like a right outside, right outside the hotel is the max. So you can get on. It's it's the um, it's the light rail. So like right outside, you can just jump on the light rail and get anywhere downtown or out to the airport. There is one. You do have to make one. I think you have to make a switch to get out it, of the it, airport. It is a single transfer from what I remember in 2018 one, and 2019. Yeah, I think there's one transfer but to, make, like, to get to the airport. But. It's, it's the transit system that I wish we had in Austin. Um, and, of course, Google Google um, Maps will keep you updated on the schedule and where things are, and it'll tell you where to go and how to get on. And it's one – you can get the app on your phone for your tickets and it's one ticket for all of the max lines and the buses and all of that stuff in Portland. So uh, yep. like I said, pretty easy to get around uh, up, to Port up to Seattle. That's a different, different train, different bus, but you can get to the Amtrak station, so, which is downtown Portland. So easy to get to as well. So. Yep. I, I enjoyed it up there when, when I made it up there and uh, like transit situation is a lot better and it's it's more centrally located than uh, we're able to swing at Longhorn. So um, like from a venue centralness sort of perspective and from uh, even things like you know, cost of hotel rooms and that sort of thing, um, I'm, I'm fine saying like uh, <laughs> Cascadia has had that on lock and uh, yeah, it's it, it's great. Yeah, and they've pr I pretty much updated all of the hotel rooms since the last time we had it. They had just started the revamp, um, like the last year we held Cascadia. So pretty much all of it has been updated, and all of the food and everything is in house now. Oh, and so even even better, the the, the people there have been great, and um, the contacts have been there for years and are still there. So. That's always good news that they do a great, really, really, really good job. And coffee all day, good <laughs> coffee. We're in Pacific Northwest. There's there's good coffee up here. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Uh, so um, that's awesome to hear. I'm, I'm super excited about that. Now I got to go check my calendar. <laughs> 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 OK, uh, so. I, I did want to share one more thing, if that's okay, uh, with the group here. Um, but uh, Ryan Weaver, who's a, a big, um, uh, one of the, you know, top contributors to Symphony Cast, uh, great conference speaker, just brilliant mind all in general, unfortunately has come down with brain cancer. And he needs uh, any support, you know, uh, that's possible for his family. Uh, but it's uh, it's pretty bad. So um, I've donated. Uh, he has a GoFundMe up uh, that goes to his family. Um, so I'm uh, not to bring the whole vibe down here. Ryan's just being super uh, courageous and strong about it. Uh, but I did want to bring that up just because any any sort of help for him, I'm sure, is greatly appreciated. Um, and, uh, yeah. So. Um, I think that covers uh, this meetup. So uh, thanks again for hopping on and uh, spending the night with us uh, or watching this later on YouTube. Uh, so thanks again, Mark. Uh, great talk. 
appreciate everybody coming out and uh, we will catch you at the next one when uh, Ben will, will do his talk. So aloha everybody. <laughs>